About three years ago, I put a roll of film in this Zeiss Icon Contaflex Super B camera, with the intention of rattling off a set of shots and then making a video to show said camera. Initially, I did take a few shots, but after that, I'd often take the camera out for the day and return having taken few or no shots at all, because I didn't want to waste the film. Anyway, in a recent video, my YouTube buddy David Flower shot a roll of film in his Practica camera, link in the description, and this jogged my memory about finishing my own roll of film. So I headed out a few times, only taking the Contaflex rather than carrying a digital camera as well, and you know what, I had the best fun ever. I'd clean forgotten how satisfying it could be using a film camera just to shoot snaps, with no way of telling how good or bad the results would be. Once I'd finished that roll of film, I sent it off for processing and waited. I have dabbled with my own processing a long time ago. It's definitely the way to go for the best results, but I have no plans of doing that again at the moment. And now my film is back, we can take a look at a few shots, along with a better look at the camera itself. The Contaflex range was launched by Zeiss in 1954, or 1953 depending on where you get your information, and my Super B came out somewhere around 1962, with the final version, the Super BC, arriving around 1965. The main difference between the Super B and the Super BC was that the Super B had a selenium cell exposure meter, whereas the Super BC had a CDS cell which required a battery, one of the old mercury batteries that are no longer available. There are a few workarounds for the non-available batteries, but the mercury batteries were ideally suited to the job because they stayed at more or less a constant 1.3 volts right up to the end of their life when they plummeted, rather than having a gradual discharge curve. Anyway, the selenium meter on my camera seems to work, but I actually don't use it. Instead, I use my modern digital exposure meter so I can be confident that I'm setting the correct exposure most of the time. I haven't found a price for the Super B when it was new, but I found an advert for a second-hand one in February 1968, and that was £77.10. In other words, £77.50. Compare that to a brand new Nikon FTN with a 50mm f2 lens at £149.50, or a Practica Nova with a 50mm Tessa lens at £49.98. So the Contaflex was quite an expensive camera. My camera came complete with its original leather case, which I'll just remove, and its pull-out rubber lens hood, which unscrews to reveal the 50mm f2.8 Tessa lens. If I move this lever at the bottom of the lens, I can actually remove the front element, and there was a range of other front elements you could put in its place, such as a 35mm f4, or an 85mm f4, or a 115mm f4, along with some more obscure choices like a stereo lens and other attachments. Behind that is the shutter speed dial with a bulb setting, then 1 second, all the way up to 1 500th of a second. The next ring sets the apertures, ranging from f2.8 to f22, with intermediate stops in between. The ring latches into each position, and there's a little button up here that releases the latch when you want to move it. And if you move the latch to the centre, it's now in auto mode, hence the letter A just behind the latch. This, as you might expect, uses the exposure meter to set the aperture relative to the shutter speed you've selected. 
If you continue to rotate the aperture ring, you get guide numbers to use with flash photography. The set in black are for the standard 50mm Tessa lens, and then round to the side are guide numbers in red to be used when the 35mm Tessa lens is installed. For my purposes, I'll just be using the standard manual f-stops, although the auto aperture does work, but I doubt that it's all that accurate. And finally we get to the focusing ring at the back, which has these two plastic grips, making it really nice to use. Actually, there's still one control left on the lens. On the underside we have the self-timer. If I move this lever into the V position, it's reasonably tight because you're winding the self-timer spring. Now when I release the shutter, it will sound like it's taken a photo, but that's just the leaf shutter closing and the mirror going up. The shot itself happens about 10 seconds later. Like that. That same lever is also used to select the flash synchronisation mode. By default it will be in the X position for electronic flash, but if I press this locking button and move the lever to the M position, it will trigger the flash ahead of the shutter being fully open. This is used for flash bulbs, which are slower to react than an electronic flash gun. On the top of the camera we have the film advancing lever, with the shutter release button in the centre. This also has the frame counter, so if I've just installed a 36 exposure film, after shutting the back of the camera I'd set the indicator to the diamond mark, then take a couple of waste shots to get rid of the film that had been exposed while the back was open, and now wind on again and the indicator points to 36 to show that there are 36 shots remaining. On the other side we have the film rewind lever. This is used in conjunction with the film release ring on the underside. When the film is finished, you rotate this ring to the R position. This releases the drive from the film and now you can rewind the film into the cassette ready for processing. Below that is an aid memoir, so you know which type of film you have in the camera, such as black and white, daylight, artificial, infrared and so on. And then beneath that we have the setting for the film speed. Lift up the ring and move the indicator to line up with the correct speed. In my case I've been using 125 ISO, or ASA as it used to be known, so that would be about there. We also have correction marks for when you're using filters, with correction factors of 2 times and 4 times. Lastly for this knob, there's an exposure compensation setting. If I rotate the knob to the cloud position, it will overexpose by one stop. By default, this will spring back to the sunlight position. The indicator on the top of the camera mirrors what's displayed in the viewfinder, which can be useful if you want to take close-up spot meter readings. The exposure meter is only active when the film is advanced and the aperture ring is set to the auto position. And now if I look through the viewfinder, I can see that I'm shooting at 125th of a second at f8. And as I increase the shutter speed, the aperture reduces accordingly. If I move the shutter speed out of the range of the available apertures, the indicator moves into the red area, and I know that a correct exposure won't be possible until I reduce the shutter speed again. When you take your shot on the Contaflex, as with many other old cameras, there's no auto-returning mirror or anything fancy like that, so everything just goes dark. Like that. To open up the back of the camera you rotate these two rings, one of which was partially rotated to rewind the film earlier, and the back just slides off. Thusly. It always seems a bit weird not having a shutter curtain on these cameras, instead it uses a leaf shutter in the lens itself. 
The Contaflex Super B is really quite a featured packed camera for its time, and it's a joy to use. Everything feels perfectly placed, and it looks absolutely stunning. It's definitely one of my favourite film cameras. There were a few issues with mine when I first got it. The lens had a fair bit of fungus, but that was easy enough to clean on the Tessa lens. Also, the slow speed shutters didn't work. This is such a common problem on old cameras. The clockwork slow speed shutter timer gets dirty and sticky and the shutter just stays open, or is very slow and erratic. That was a slightly tricky fix, and I didn't film it, although I did take a couple of reference shots while I was working on it. The slow speed timer is on the next level down, which I didn't photograph, but the issue on this camera turned out to be friction on the spring that powers the timer, and the rest of the mechanism was clean and working, so all I needed to do on this occasion was clean and re-oil said spring, and we were back in business. You'll have seen some of the shots taken on this camera dotted around in the breaks between sections of this video, but here are a few more. One of the things I enjoyed most about shooting with film again was just taking snaps. I wasn't trying to create a masterpiece, and I wasn't reeling off multiple shots to home in on that perfect image. It was all nice and relaxing, with no pressure or deadlines. Which is a good job, as it took me three years to use up the film. And of course, there are a few potential drawbacks using film. I must have reached the end of the roll one shot before I expected, so what would have been quite a nice shot of this Ford pickup now has a partial double exposure. But it's not the end of the world, and it all adds to that film experience. That just about wraps it up for this video. What's next? Well, I've already got a film in this 1961 KMZ start camera, and another role in my EXA camera. Hopefully I'll be a bit quicker getting those films run through, but if not, I'll be back in 2026 with the results. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video, and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.